It seems like we all cried watching the heartbreaking goodbye of Jack and Rose from the Titanic. Oops, spoiler, sorry. But the real-life stories from the sinking of the famous ship were no less touching. Joseph LaRoche was born in 1886 in Haiti to a wealthy family. He was growing up without a dad, but his mother was a self-made woman and a respected merchant. His uncle was the head of his country. Joseph was fluent in French, Creole, and English. At the age of 15, Joseph realized he wanted to become an engineer. There were no engineering schools in Haiti, so he moved to France to get his education. The journey took him a whopping 83 days. Still, in his student years, Joseph met Juliet in a suburb of Paris through a mentor. They soon became friends, and then it grew into something bigger. The couple decided to get married. There was only one problem. Joseph couldn't find a well-paid qualified job even after completing his studies because of racial discrimination. The intelligent young man realized he could do better. Plus, he needed to provide for his growing family. His third kid was on the way. His uncle back in Haiti promised he'd help Joseph secure a job as a mathematics professor. His mother was overjoyed that her son and his family would be living in Haiti. She bought them first-class tickets for the French liner La France as a reunion gift. But that liner had really weird rules separating parents from their offspring for meals. The LaRoches didn't want to leave their youngsters and make them feel sad on a trip across the ocean. So they decided to trade their first-class tickets for La France for second-class tickets for RMS Titanic's maiden voyage. The Titanic was all the hype, and it didn't separate families. So it looked like a great deal. They planned to change for another ship in New York that would take them straight to their final destination in Haiti. The family boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912, at Cherbourg. They had three days to enjoy the luxurious staterooms, a dining salon, a library, and three outdoor promenade decks available to second-class passengers. Juliet sent a letter to her father from Titanic's final stop in Queenston, Ireland. She told him they were more than happy with the accommodation. They had two bunks in their cabin and a couch that converted into a bed for their youngest family members. The family made friends with some nice co-passengers with whom they had traveled together from Paris. She thought they had been the only other French people on board, so they sat together for meals. Juliet mentioned they had all spent time together on the deck of the liner. She also wrote the people on board were friendly. Although some sources say the family had gone through quite a lot of mean stares, gossip, and remarks. On the night of April 14th, their exciting journey came to an abrupt end. Even though Titanic's wireless operators had received warnings about drifting ice from nearby ships, the liner continued to plow ahead at full throttle. It was around 11.40 p.m. when Titanic's hull collided with the iceberg around 370 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. The practically unsinkable ship was severely under-equipped with lifeboats, enough for only about half of its 2,200 passengers. The nearest rescue ship, the Carpathia, was too far away to help. A steward woke up the LaRoche family and took them to the lifeboats, as Juliet remembered later. She couldn't speak any English, so everything that was going on seemed even scarier to her. A little after midnight, the crew received the order to give priority to women and children when boarding the lifeboats. Juliet later remembered a terrible panic had begun as people had been pushing each other to get to the desired seat. At some point, she felt they had pulled away her older daughter and thrown her into the abyss. A moment later, she had joined her Simone in the same emptiness. So, pregnant Juliet and her two daughters got spots in lifeboat 14. But they had to say goodbye to Joseph as the boat was being lowered into the sea. He wrapped his coat around Juliet, saying she'd need it, and promised to get in another lifeboat and see her and the little ones again in New York. The 25-year-old Joseph LaRoche didn't manage to stay true to his word. In a couple of hours, Titanic sank underwater, taking the lives of almost 1,500 people. Joseph was one of them. Juliet and the girls were among the 700 survivors who had been rescued by the Cunard liner Carpathia several hours later. Once they reached New York, they were looking through the crowds of people, hoping to see Joseph again. When it became obvious they wouldn't find him, it was time for them to decide what to do and where to go. 
without any knowledge of English or money that had gone down with the ship, Juliet managed to survive in America only for three weeks and then had no other choice but to go back to France. Joseph's uncle was no longer able to help them, as others had taken his life four months after the Titanic tragedy. In December 1912, Juliet gave birth to a son who she named Joseph after his father. For the rest of her life, she couldn't get over the loss of her beloved husband. That's why she didn't like to speak about what had happened on Titanic and told her children not to mention it. In 1995, a member of the Titanic Historical Society interviewed Louise, who was the last remaining La Roche child and the last French survivor of the sinking. And that's when the world first heard about this heartbreaking story. It inspired some plays and articles, but it never got the same attention as the story of other passengers. You probably remember the elderly couple going down together in their bed on the Titanic. It was inspired by Isidore and Ida Strauss. They were both born in Germany and emigrated to the United States as kids. They met in New York and got married five years later. Isidore started a china and porcelain business with his brother that grew into the glassware department at Macy's and turned them into multimillionaires. Isidore and Ida were well known in New York, not only for their wealth and charity, but also for their love and devotion to each other. In 1912, the couple decided to run away from the New York winters and headed for Europe. By that time, they'd already been married for 40 years. In early April, it was time for them to sail back home to New York. They normally traveled on huge German liners, but at that time, they couldn't resist the hype of everyone talking about that new luxury liner, the RMS Titanic. That's how they ended up in one of the first-class private suites at the top of the ship. The Strauss couple spent their evenings dining in front of a live orchestra in a hall filled with fancy furniture and expensive wooden paneling. On the night of April 14th, they felt a slight tremor and then left their private suite and waited for instructions from the crew. They told the passengers not to lose their passes, as they'd need them when everyone got back on board. But the ship was going under. The Strauss couple were standing next to lifeboat 8. Mr. Strauss, who was 67 at the time, was offered a seat with his wife because of his age. He refused it, saying he was not too old to sacrifice himself for a woman. He wanted to wait and make sure no women and kids were left behind. Ellen Bird, Ida's maid, hesitated before getting on the lifeboat. But Ida told her to go. She took the easy decision not to leave her husband on the sinking ship. Ida took off her beautiful mink coat and handed it to her shivering maid, saying she wouldn't be needing it anymore. Isidore didn't manage to convince her to save herself, so they stayed together till the end. Some of the surviving first-class passengers later remembered they had seen the couple standing peacefully on the deck, holding hands, just waiting. Just wait. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.